Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Room for Discussion. Today, we have the honor of hosting the Director General of the European Space Agency, Johan Dietrich Werner. By the time this interview breaks the atmosphere, we will have discussed the Director and his role at the ESA, Space 4.0, the space private industry, the space public industry, and what space will look like in the 21st century. We will launch these topics with an additional payload of current day advancements and predictions for what space will look like in the future. Our guest, Mr. Werner, has served previously as a civil engineer, a professor, and as head of the German Aerospace Center. In 2015, he landed the position of Director General of the European Space Agency. Under his directorship, Mr. Werner has continued ACE's work through Galileo, its navigational system, through Copernicus, its Earth observation system, and numerous other activities. With that, please give a warm round of applause for our guest, Mr. Werner. Hello. Hi. So, Mr. Werner? Yes. Welcome. Before we... I'm Jan. Jan? Jan. Not, not Johann Dietrich, not Werner. I'm Jan, okay? No. Jan, before we board our rocket ship and get into the real space questions, we just want to break the atmosphere with a simple question. What are your favorite <laughs> space interviews or space movies? Sp favorite space movies? There are two, if I'm allowed. Yeah, of course. Go One for it. which not, none of you know. It's from the 60s. It is called Raumpatrouille Orion. That was a <laughs> German movie. Um, but the thing was, the, the, uh, all the people in that movie were international. So the commander was an American, and there was uh, some uh, from uh, Turkey, some from France, and, and the security officer was from Russia, a lady. And uh, this was not only because she was a very nice lady, but to, to make a, p a movie at that time in the 60s when we had the Cold War, nobody of you knows know about that, but to have a, a mixed uh, group, a mixed team, that was my favorite at that time. And today it's Interstellar. Interstellar. It's not gravity. I know Sandra Bullock, but it's not gravity. It is Interstellar. Do you think the cooperation in the German movie you just listed has inspired you in your interpretation of space today? So there is a, always the same story, but uh, I cannot avoid to say it. Uh, when I was three years old, this was after the war, I can tell you, but um, so it was 1957, the Russians launched Sputnik. And my father took me on his arm and said, Jan, look, there is Sputnik. <laughs> Obviously, you, c you could not see the satellite. But if your father, when you are three years old, tell you, tells you, you see Sputnik, then you see it. So this was the, let's say, the inspiring moment to enter into the space sector. So before we get too far into our interview, I think it's important for our audience to know what exactly the European Space Agency is. Could you provide with I have with no, us? Clue. no clue. What, is, what exactly, I can tell you a little bit after three and a half years what I believe what it is. Okay. But uh, what is really exact, I don't know. So the European Space Agency is an organization having 22 member states. We are not part of the European Union. We are what is called an intergovernmental organization. So we have 22 member states. And all of them are now together, each of the countries, and then of course the Netherlands, they have one vote, one country, one vote, irrespective of the funding they give to us. And it was founded in 1975, and uh, the convention, which was at that time derived and developed, is, national, is on the level of a national law. So that means all the parliaments of our member states had to ratify it. And it's interesting because sometimes we get the the idea, oh, wh why not change the convention? But then you have to go to 22 parliaments and get, get the support and therefore it will never happen. And this convention is just a masterpiece of lawyers. I hear some lawyers in the room. So if you want to learn something, take the convention of ESA. It's a masterpiece for organizations. You see, I'm from Germany, as you hear. Uh, and uh, in Germany, whenever we create some organization, we first of all look all to these different types of who is managing what hierarchical structure here and there and everything. This convention says ESA has just three, three bodies. One body is the council of the member state. One is the director general. And one is a, a special committee for science. That's all. Nothing is de de decided about the organization, and this since 1975. 
So we are intergovernmental, and what is also important, we do not have a constant funding by our member states. So we meet our ministers, the ministers come to ESA, together, we call that a ministerial, and at that time the Director General has to put proposals on the table, and if he is not successful, the, uh, the agency has to be closed the very next day. Because we don't have a stable budget at all, like a university, we have just zero general funding, but overall we are now having something like six billion per year. Euros. Not shilling or lira. Or not dollars. No, 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 no. Could you give us uh, some examples of activities that the European Space Agency is involved yeah, in? Yeah, we developed this uh, last uh, six months or one year, we developed a special um, narrative of to explain what we are doing. We are doing science and exploration. Science and exploration means, for instance, the International Space Station, Andre Kuipers, as an mm -hmm. example. This is the guy of ESA. Uh, so we are uh, organizing for the European member states being part of the International Space Station. We organize uh, not only the space flights, but also the research on board of the International Space Station. We are sending missions to Mars, to Moon, and other uh, locations. And we are also looking deep into the universe through science. So right now we have a spacecraft called Pepe Colombo, which is traveling to Mercury, the uh, planet which is closest to the sun. It will take it's about seven, uh, seven uh, years, nine billion kilometers. It is electric mobility because we have an electric engine on board and you have to compare it with other electric vehicles on the street. So uh, we are traveling for seven years without refueling, without uh, recharging and about nine billion kilometers. So it's, it's a world record uh, and a speed with 150,000 kilometers per hour. Then we have what we call safety and security. We are not talking about defense because ESA, according to its convention, is exclusively peaceful purpose only. So this is very clear. We are talking about safety and security. So for instance, you all are using internet. You would like to have light. You would like to have uh, transmission here to the, uh, to, the, um, uh, to the loudspeakers and everything. But if the sun is uh, unhappy with that and sends out a solar flare, this can be stopped within 15 days, 15 hours. Within 15 hours, everything dead. So we are taking care of that in the safety, uh, space safety program. We have space debris, we are taking care of that. We are also looking for issues on the ground, for instance, uh, tsunami, earthquakes, sea level rise to the Netherlands. Um, and this we call um, safety and security applications. And then uh, we are doing applications, typical applications, Earth observation, navigation, telecommunication. So for instance, you have heard Copernicus program of the European Union. This is uh, partially financed by ESA. 30% comes from ESA. And we are organizing all the launches. We are really designing the, um, the satellites. Then we are doing telecommunication. We are developing new telecommunication satellites. For instance, we with um, uh, laser telecommunication, so which is more secured and faster. Then we are developing and uh, new satellite navigation systems. Don't use this uh, American copy. Galileo is a European uh, satellite navigation system. Yeah. If you have a good smartphone, you can already receive it. So ESA is developing this technology, and ESA is also implementing the uh, satellites into orbit. And then we are also responsible for the launcher developments in Europe, and for the big ones, Ariane 6 uh, and Vega C, and new technologies, especially here in Estec, close by in Nordwijk, we have our technical center where we are developing um, new technologies in uh, quantum entanglement, in whatever, so new technologies. You just mentioned activities, but also goals in outer space. I think it's also important that we touch upon a vision for space. In 2016, you proposed the idea of Space 4.0, I believe. Could you please explain to us what 4.0 is okay. and how it differs from the other versions? Okay, the sometimes the buzzwords which you can hear is new space. Huh? That's a typical sp buzzword which is used. And for me, buzzword, the buzzword new space is too narrow. We are in a shift of paradigm uh, of space. And I don't know whether you are using here in the Netherlands also the word of Industry 4.0. Industry 4.0 means Internet of Things, and uh, so really digitalization in industry. And I was thinking about uh, what is the situation in space. Space 1.0, this is and was astronomy. Space 2.0 is a race in space of the 60s uh, of last century. 
space 3.0. This is where we are. That means we have some global activities on the International Space Station, some new applications, Earth observation, navigation, etc. But now we are moving towards a total shift of paradigm with sp space 4.0. We have more than 70 spacefaring nations worldwide. We have new actors also on the private sector, industry or universities are developing and producing and launching uh, space missions. We have totally new fields of applications, no limitation on Earth and in space. Um, and that means already this system is changed. And then what is also changed, the commercialization of space, which is usually used with uh, the word of new space, but also digitalization, artificial intelligence, but another very important point for me, which is not at all covered with uh, new space or others, is participation. I'm a strongly believer that two brains are smarter than one brain, three brains are smarter than two brains, and even 101 brains are smarter than 100 brains. Meaning, we should take care of man as many brains as possible to develop the future. Not only one hero announcing worldwide what his vision is, we should really look into the situation where we put together brains of different people because different people with different ideas, diversity is the, 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 the buzzword for that, they lead us to better solutions for the future. And all of this is covered with Space 4.0. And is that also the European Space Agency's vision for Space 4.0 or just yours? Okay, if you look into the convention of ESA, it's very simple. The Director General defines uh, the vision. <laughs> all right. I think you just mentioned particularly, for instance, the growth in private commercial industries, the amount of numbers of spacefaring nations, but another integral part of the conception of Space 4.0 is what you mentioned, which is this concept of a moon village. Yes. Could you please explain to us okay. what the moon village is? I try. I failed several times, but uh, uh, trial and error is part of life. <laughs> um, the only thing is you should have uh, one more trial than failure. That's the only thing. So, moon village. I tell you first what it is not. It is not a project. It is not a single mission. Is it not a national idea? It is not, not an ESA project. That's all. No, 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 no. The idea was the following. It came up after a, a, an evaluation of the system. We have the International Space Station. The International Space Station is doing science and research. We have astronauts there also inspiring people on ground. And if astronauts are telling us about the thin atmosphere of the Earth, people are really, uh, really aware of what is happening. So that means the International Space Station has a lot of functions, research, technology, awareness, but also geopolitical aspects. We have several nations in the International Space Station. So we have the Americans, we have the Russians, we have the Japanese, the Canadians, and the Europeans. This is already good. But if you look to a globe, yeah. then you have more countries in the world than just these. So this was the idea. The International Space Station will come to an end at a certain point. Maybe it's in five years, maybe it's in 10 years. And at the same time, we have to take care of more activities of more countries at the same time. Now, whenever you have a, s a single spacecraft, like the International Space Station, Station you have hatches. And the hatches are limiting who is allowed to enter. Uh, you don't need a wall bec between two countries. It's enough if you have a hatch. You can already close the hatch. Now, the idea of the moon village was the moon has no hatch. And it should not have a geopolitical hatch. That means the moon is there, each and every one. And right now, it's even easier because the moon is bright today. Uh, you can go there, wherever you are. So this is the idea of the moon village, free and open access. And the role of ESA in that respect is changing from being just an agency of developing a mission or together with industry developing a mission. Suddenly we have the role of an enabler or a broker. We are putting together worldwide actors who would like to go to the moon and do something. We have companies providing launchers. We have companies providing rovers on the surface of the moon. We have companies or agencies providing descent modules and ascent modules. We have and a British company now is developing a special communication for the surface of the moon. So these putting together, it's multi-partner open concept. That's the idea, to be really to do something for the world. It sounds great, but it is great. So you've already mentioned uh, some other players in space. You've hinted at other countries. And so 
as we know, there are numerous other space agencies around the world. It's not just the European Space Agency. We have I NASA it, yes. in America. We have the Chinese and the Russians. Uh, but what are the key differences between the European Space Agency and these other agencies? First of all, we are European. Yeah. Second, we are the old, only multinational space agency. We have 22 member states, um, uh, 20 out of which are member states of the European Union. Two, Switzerland and Norway are not. And just to answer that question immediately, UK will most probably leave the EU, but not leave either. So therefore, we are the only multinational space agency. And then there are many similarities, but what is clear for ESA, we are a comprehensive space agency, as I mentioned before. We are doing science exploration, safety and security uh, applications, uh, and enabling and support technologies. So we are doing each and everything. The only thing which we are missing in Europe is transportation of uh, astronauts. We don't have that capability. Human space flight. But it's not that bad because to sometimes it's not that bad to also to, 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 to have the duty to, to rely on others because then you're working together. So it's not that bad. It has also some positive advantage. So have you said, yes, working with each other, it seems quite important. I mean, one of the relationships that the European Space Agency has had the longest with is with NASA. Yes. Uh, you've worked together on the Hubble telescope and you've worked together on the new, the new up and coming Orion spacecraft. So how... By the way, interesting, it's again Orion. As I said, 65, the movie was also Orion. Oh, right, also Orion, yeah. all right. Um, how important do you say, how important is it for space exploration that you work closely with these other space agencies, not only NASA, but with the Russians as well? There are several reasons for that. Number one is um, a single nation in Europe cannot afford all the activities ESA is doing. And if we cooperate on a global scale, we can do even better things than just one nation can do. So even NASA or the Chinese or the uh, Russians. So by um, putting together activities, we can do more, which I always say is competition is a driver, as we know in sports, who would run faster than 10 seconds without any competition for 100 meter. Nobody would do. I would take a bicycle anyhow. Uh, and, but cooperation is an enabler. Through cooperation you can do things you cannot do alone. And therefore this is more uh, a technical aspect or financial aspect while cooperation is good. But the other thing is the geopolitical aspect. By cooperating with each and every state worldwide, we are really preaching earthly crisis. Even during the Ukraine crisis, Crimea crisis, and right now, we are launching astronauts from Baikonur, Americans, Canadians, Japanese, Russians and Europeans, um, and this is for me a good sign that uh, space can really bridge earthly crisis. And therefore, cooperation is a must for us, and for us, ESA, it's a day-to-day -day work because we know how to, to do cooperation. I do want to touch upon that because at the same time where you're pursuing and saying it's an opportunity to bridge a gap between, for instance, geopolitical conflicts, yes. we do see a growing tent trend, at least, uh, towards isolationism or self-interested in nations yes. across the world. Even NASA, for instance, has policies that prevent it from cooperating with China yes. at all. Uh, do these national security and self-serving political interests sometimes make it difficult for the ESA to cooperate with other space agencies, such as NASA? And Not for us. Not for you? Not for us, no. We, uh, that, that's uh, one of our beauty. We, we can cooperate at the same time with the Chinese and the Americans. And sometimes the Americans are saying, OK, we would like to cooperate with the Chinese, but as we are not allowed because of Congress or whatever, Isa, can you a little bit play the, the, the partner in between? So we have missions together with the Chinese. Not so many, but we have. We have very many uh, programs together with NASA. We are working very closely together with Russia with India, with Japan, and so on and so on. So for us, uh, and I believe you, you said a very important word, isolation. I think it is justified that isolation is not a good instrument worldwide. That's my belief, and therefore I believe that we in space, we can do really, we can bridge crisis, we can bridge earthly borders because space is uh, anyhow flying above. So therefore we have, uh, we have something to do. So you mentioned Russia, and we have a quote here that we just want to run by you. It's by Dmitry Rogozin, the yes. director of general yes. of Roscosmos. And he himself said that the relationships between the Legion space agencies need to grow stronger and to withstand political uh, pressure. Uh, why does Mr. Rogozin think that space agencies are susceptible to political interests? This was on the topic of NASA and ESA. So 
the person of uh, Mr. Rogozin is an interesting person, just to mention that one, because he was one uh, who was responsible also for the Crimea conflict. So therefore, he is a persona non grata in Europe and in the US. So you, are not invi you can invite a lot of people, as I learned, also from uh, Spain and uh, Catalonia. But uh, try to invite him, uh, and you will, you will fail. That's the adva disadvantage, because opinion. you can invite him. He would say yes, but your government will not allow him to come. And this is an interesting person, because, of course, he is now head of the, uh, of the Russian Space Agency, and we are cooperating. So it's, it's, uh, that is a tricky thing. So it's a little bit of a tactic, do you think, maybe? I don't know with what Mr. Putin thought when he was uh, deciding that. Interesting. Interesting. I don't know. You don't know. I, I mean, I have some guess, but uh, you are asking me what I know, and I, uh, I don't know. So would go you ahead. like to give a guess, maybe no. potentially, just between us? Just between us, no. <laughs> no. Right. Well, uh, space but what would you do if you're Mr. Putin? And you would like that you are really breaking these borders, and uh, what would you do? Well, I think would you put him on a p on a position where he has to bridge earthly crisis? Well, I, I don't think it's a surprise that the Russian director general might be the one turning it around on the Western Europeans to say that they're the ones that need to cooperate more. Uh, that's my personal, but we'll talk about that another time. Uh, space race began. I'm open. I'm ready to hear. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, about a half century ago, uh, we do need to touch upon the space race in general and competition and partnerships in general, yes. but about a half century ago, the space race began with Soviet Union and the United States, and China only entered the scene about 2003. They sent a man to space, and last year they landed a probe on the dark side of the moon, first country to ever do so. W do you see China as a competitor or a partner in space? Yes. Yes. Okay. We have both, another quote. Both. Because, <laughs> so as I said, competition is a driver, but... Um, uh, uh, cooperation is an enabler. For us, there is still some competition. And competition is, has also its positive value, for instance, when we are talking about the price tag of a space mission. So uh, there, uh, and also speed with missions, there is competition between industry, between countries, has some advantage. But at the same time, we always should look for cooperation. So therefore, we have, together with the Chinese, um, a project called SMILE, where we look to the magnetosphere of the sun, and they also Canada is involved, so we are looking really for clear cooperation, and we are all. Some of our astronauts are now learning Chinese in order to be able to fly to the Chinese space station uh, later on. So I really believe cooperation is a good thing. There is some competition, and it's always interesting when something happens. For instance, when the Chinese were landing on the dark side of the moon, which does not exist, it is the far side of the moon. Far side it of is moon. as bright as the uh, near side. Um, so then I was immediately, I got a question, is that also possible for Europe? And of course it's possible, but the question is what is the value? But this is uh, another story. I, I mean, of course y you can say China might be looking for both competition and cooperation. And, and also for national yeah. pride. Huh? They, have, mm -hmm. they want to convince their people also, and I understand that. It's, yeah. by the way, also in the different countries. Uh, and also, also here, the, the Americans want to show their country that they are strong in space, the, the Europeans, the different member states of ESA, when we have an astronaut, uh, then of course they are proud to have this astronaut. I accept that, but I'm working for European and global cooperation. But I think there's a notable concern that we could have that maybe it could be, again, something of a tactic. Uh, I would like to list another thing to you, just to be careful. Ye Paijian, uh, Chief Commander and Chief Designer of the Chinese Lunar Exploration Program, so a pretty high up, has said about the moon, if other countries go to the moon, then they will take over, and you won't even be able to go, even if you want to. It, it, to us, that seems a little bit like China viewing outer space exploration in terms of a zero-sum game. Uh, isn't that a little too far when it comes to the, the terms of cooperation that we're searching for? I don't understand your question. What do you so mean? So, the quote that we have yes. is we have the... It's the head of, it's the chief yeah, designer of the Chinese Lunar yes. Exploration Program. And he's saying, he even made an analogy between the East Asian Sea when talking about the moon, right? Yes. And so if you have someone that is so high up talking about the moon in terms of it needs to be something that's grasped before other countries can, when you say, of course, there's some parts of cooperation with China, it, it, if this is the underlying problem... It's not. It's you don't not. Think so? I, I have several discussions with our Chinese colleagues, and it's not this. I don't know where this quote comes from. Of course, it comes from him, but no. I don't know in, in which environment he said that. But the moon is a neutral, uh, a neutral, neutral place, and therefore, 
um, the Americans put some flags over there. And I was thinking, why not fly to the moon and bring the American flag back? <laughs> that would be a good sign to, ma to make it clear that the moon is not owned like a claim in, uh, in, uh, in some two, uh, 500, 150 years ago or so. It's a, a gold claim. Eh? So it's the moon is a neutral area. And what I'm really looking forward for the moon village is that there are no fences and no walls on the moon. We should not say this is you are leaving the American sector or you are leaving <laughs> the Chinese sector. We should take the moon as an opportunity and not as a claim. So still on our, our favorite topic of China, China tends not to not only go to the moon, but to also stay there. They would like to build up their own lunar colony. Not their own. They, they are part of the moon village. All right. And not a colony. We have to make a difference between colony and go there and stay. This is a difference. So for instance, if you are in Antarctic, I have to apologize to for interrupting you, but it's That's important right, for yeah, me. If you, if you look to Antarctica or the Arctic, you have their labs, which are permanently used by humans, but these are not colonies of, <laughs> Europe, of uh, humans staying there forever. And I think one should really forget about the, the, the possibility to stay forever on Moon or Mars. That's bullshit. So it, is, it makes sense to have labs on the Moon. It makes sense to stay for a longer period on Mars, and maybe for tourism as well as for research and science. But the Earth is the one and only planet we know in our solar system where life is as beautiful as the Netherlands. So therefore, we should really <laughs> see the Earth as the place to live and not in Kent. And I can tell you, I was not very unhappy when I heard that last week Mars One bank, uh, went bankrupt. Yeah. I was not unhappy about that because to, to send people for a one-way trip to Mars, this is just not ethical from my point of view. Even if a single person would say, ah, I do it. But, but this is Big Brother, including uh, dying and whatever. So I don't accept that one. But the ch so you said that uh, a permanent presence on the moon is not... Uh, presence is fine, but not colonization. Not colonization, make fine. a difference yeah. between that. But the Chinese still have this ambition to use the moon yes. for economic gain, yes. to use the yes. lunar resources. And my question is, should the moon be used for economic gain? Should we use the It will be resources? used. You cannot say should it. Or it will be, for instance, if there is tourism towards the moon. I mean, to the moon and back, you can do it in one week. You can do it even uh, between two examinations at university. So you can go there for, uh, for one week, and it will be done. So whatever we believe. Um, uh, we, right now, we don't believe in either, and this is not only the Director General, that to take resources out of space, to bring them back and to make money out of it, is not the time right now. But who knows in, in about 30, 40 years. But to use the material over there, this is very intelligent and uh, necessary. So far, all spacecraft we had, wherever they went to, uh, whether uh, to Moon or Mars or whatever, they brought all the stuff there, stayed there, sometimes bringing some stuff back, but not using the stuff as such. And yeah. so also part of the Moon Village idea is, for instance, to build on the far side of the Moon a big telescope using the Moon material. Um, we call that in space or in situ resource utilization. And ESA is uh, uh, working on that. And also on the near side or wherever on the Moon, if you want to have astronauts stay there for more than a couple of days, then to have some shelters, it's very important. And again, the shelters should not be built from material from Earth, but using the regolith of uh, Moon and uh, to do something like concrete, as you said, I'm a civil engineer, so this is my future, maybe. So, um, how should the economic development of the Moon come about? Should it be uh, shared by all of humanity, or should individual countries or sort of players What use would the you resources? answer to that question? Because I have the feeling it's a rhetorical well, question. Now I would say it should be only Trump. It should only be Trump. Well. Are you happy with my answer? No, I'm not. No, happy okay, with your then don't ask well, me a you question ask me where you have answer. already the answer. Well, I'm I'm a law student. I study the law, and I've read the 1967. Ah, you are a lawyer, a law well, student. So not read yet. the convention first. So, uh, but uh, no, it should not be uh, the the right or the uh, property of a single person or a single nation. Of course yeah. not. Of course. And it's also in the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. Yeah, but we have to renew that one eh, in order to, and we have to, we, we need more signatures for that. So really it's important. And uh, so there is, for instance, Luxembourg, which is very active in, uh, in space mining. And so uh, this is something where we have to discuss in the future. But I think to use the material, this is for me fine, to bring it back 
is for me still a question of economic reason. The Chinese are saying they want to have helium-3 from the moon, but I learned from some uh, physicists that uh, that's really uh, not really, really an economic solution, but I don't know. But there will be something in the future, and, but I'm not afraid that uh, you wake up one morning and uh, the moon was brought back to Earth because they used all the material and you don't uh, have any moon anymore. anymore. That will not happen. All right, thank goodness. Um, or half moon only or so. Uh, that yeah. would. Um, moving on now to uh, Mr. Trump. Ah. Uh, <laughs> China's increasing activity in outer space has been perceived in the United States as a new security threat. Yeah. And Mr. Trump has even called for the creation of a space force. Yeah. <laughs> yesterday, should, yeah. Should we yesterday be worried or today? Yeah, yesterday. Yep. The, the, uh, this uh, special rule, yeah. Okay. Should we be, as Europeans, no. also see Chinese activity as a no. security? No. No. Why not? Because Star Wars is stupid. I mean, the, <laughs> the movie is fine, but <laughs> it's, it's stupid. Uh, the space should be a neutral area. Of course, you can use space also for observation on Earth. Yes, you can do that. But for instance, some, some dreamers or some people are believing we should build robots to catch uh, other spy satellites and bring them down. Whoever built such a robot, I would congratulate him for being so stupid. <laughs> because if you build a, co a, a satellite with a, a capability to grab another satellite to bring it down, we could use it good for, for space debris removal, but uh, if you want to destroy another satellite, you just need a block of concrete. That's enough. You don't need a, a special satellite because you just hit it and then it's gone. I hope that this will not come uh, because uh, it would be really a change uh, uh, of the world. I hope that the transparency which can be gained through, uh, through space is securing the world. So not as an offensive matter, but as a security aspect and therefore ESA, with its convention, uh, exclusively peaceful purpose, we are just looking for safety and security and not for any offensive matter. Right, I think we're going to put you in the fray, maybe a chance for another rhetorical question. If anyone has an audience question, like or comment also, it's fine. I, as I said, participation is my main point. I hope I understand the question. <laughs> I'll try. Um, you said that the space should be a neutral place and that it should basically benefit anyone. But the fact is, all the people or all the entities that are interacting with the space, they are only from northern countries. So um, my question is, um, how is the interaction in space, um, what is going to be its effect on the inequalities of north-south? I did not understand the question. I said, well, I, I was afraid about it. Did you understand? I don't really understand. Could you repeat okay, the question? Can yeah, you I can repeat, repeat the question. It's, it's a little bit the mic is a bit the problem, yeah. not you. Um, my question is, uh, how is the interaction of um, European agencies or American agencies in the space right now, um, how, how is it going to affect the inequalities between northern countries and ah. so southern countries? Okay. So, ESA, as I said, we are international by, by our DNA. Uh, but uh, that means also that we feel some responsibility worldwide. So we have not only relations to uh, the spacefaring nations like United States or like uh, China, uh, Russia, etc. We also have a special uh, Africa activity, just as one example. So um, for emerging countries, and I was just in South Africa some three weeks ago, and we discussed with them how we can really further develop uh, because, uh, again, the, what I said about brains is also uh, valid for countries. So two countries is better than one, three is better than two, and so on. So therefore, we are looking especially what, what can we bring also to them, but also what is the benefit. And we are not looking, they are not in our cooperation looking into to the question of what can we sell to them. This is not our idea. But for instance, in uh, using telemedicine, teleeducation, um, this is something we can really offer. Um, and uh, especially with South Africa, what I said earlier concerning the solar flares, they are very strong in space weather, and therefore we are now looking for some intensive cooperation with them concerning uh, space weather. You all know space weather. The Northern Lights, this is space weather, just to tell you. The Northern Lights, this is part of uh, space weather. And you have al also the same aurora at the Southern Hemisphere, and close and between South Africa and uh, Amer South America, 
there is even a special area where our magnetic field of the Earth has some irregularities. And there, this space, this uh, solar flare activity is a very special one. So I believe it's not a question of donate or getting money out of it. It is a, a global responsibility on the one hand side, and the other one, again, cooperation is an enabler for both sides. We are winning. They are winning. Fine. We actually have time for another one. White shirt over there. Right there. It's fine. Cool. Um, so you scratched the problem of space waste earlier, waste, and um, my question is about the regulation of small satellites, which get launched increasingly in India, SpaceX, and all these small satellites, which SpaceX, yeah. I don't know, but yeah. Yeah. So um, how do you? see the regulations coming with preventing the overuse of really small satellites? OK, this is a one hour question. Um, so this is a very serious issue uh, as well. Uh, so uh, we have the situation that um, there is some regulation, some rule, I should say, that the satellite which is launched should not stay in orbit longer than 25 years after the operation. So number one for me, not all satellites are following this rule. Number two, 25 years is for me much too long. Because uh, to launch a satellite and then to have it 25 years in orbit without any operation, this is really dangerous. We have about 4,500 satellites right now in space. Only 1,500 are active, meaning 3,000 are passive, dangerous. We had already accidents that satellites were colliding. The International Space Station and other satellites have very often they have to move in order not to hit another uh, uh, space debris part. So this is a serious factor. And now with, with more and more satellites coming up, you have heard about mega constellations. Um, also, uh, SpaceX are thinking about that. Google, others are thinking OneWeb. They, when, they, when you ask them, how do you do this really, these cheap mega constellations, because a satellite of a mega constellation should be less than 1 million euro, while a satellite of the bigger part is something like, let's say, 100 million. That means they are, and when we ask them, so how do you, what is the, 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 the miracle behind it? They say, ah, it's simple. We are reducing the reliability a little bit. And when you ask, what does it mean? Ah, just 10%. You know, let's consider 10%. If you have thousands of new satellites and 10% of them are not reliable, that means you have hundreds of non-reliable satellites. And therefore, and this is not only the CubeSats, it's uh, microsats, nanosats, all the different types. Um, and therefore, it's very important, that number one, that these satellites are in, uh, in orbits which don't take too long to bring them down. And normally, CubeSats are in orbits like that. Um, and the other thing is, for the future, I have the vision. It's not the same vision as uh, Elon Musk, who would like to go to Mars. But my vision uh, has a more sustainable solution. That in each and every case of a satellite launch, the one who is launching has to describe and really bindingly binding what happens. So either he or she, doesn't matter, has, a has on board of the satellite a redundant system, a parallel system, which in case that the main function doesn't work, automatically deorbits the satellite. That would be a very clean solution. Or he or she says, I don't have that on board, but I have a contract with a company in the Netherlands which is offering the service to bring down old satellites. And I already have the contract with them, and they will take care of that. Or, number three, I give a deposit to ESA or to whomever in case my satellite doesn't work any longer and it, I don't bring it down, then ESA or whoever it is is using the money, the deposit, to bring it down. So this would be my solution. I'm not happy about what some are now proposing, that they say, we want to have uh, an orbit just for us. This is, again, the same what I said with the moon and other. This is stupid. Huh? I mean, we should not try to organize the, 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 the universe in national or institutional uh, uh, ownership. So therefore, 
And by the way, if you have this orbit for your satellite and some, it goes down, it goes through the other orbits as well. So it doesn't work anyhow. So this is the answer. So CubeSats, I'm not so afraid because normally CubeSats are not in high orbits. They are in low orbits. Therefore, they don't stay for long. But uh, we have enough or, uh, satellites in wrong orbits. And we have about 750,000 particles of a size of at least one centimeter in orbit. 750,000. And each of them is, has a speed of something like 28,000 kilometers per hour, so much faster than any bullet of a gun. And therefore, also astronauts are endangered when they are outside. But not only that, also satellites. We had, for instance, one of our satellites had an impact with this very tiny part, only five millimeter. And by that, part of the solar panel was destroyed. So it is, it is not science fiction like in gravity. It is science fact. And therefore, you're totally right. We need rules for that. We need to handle it. And we have to have solutions, also technical solutions for it. I think we need to grasp on the underlying fact that is also causing, for instance, the rapid growth in satellite launches, which is in the past it was only states that have been particularly invested in developing and contributing to outer space exploration or satellites, but now we see private industry taking off faster than it's ever done before, almost a little bit uncontrollable. Uh, why is the private industry now interested in space as opposed to the 1950s? Okay. Private and private is different. Okay. Can we agree that the company Airbus is a private company? OK, they are in space since years and years and years. Can we agree that Boeing is a private company? They are since years and years and years. This is not what you mean. This is just what I want to make clear. So we have private companies, and Lockheed Martin, private companies were building all these spacecrafts, but normally in direct link and in direct management from space agencies. This is now changing a bit. And there we see some actors which are called private actors, Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, Elon Musk, and others. And suddenly, the people see them as totally different species. So they are, they are different sometimes. For instance, in case of Jeff Bezos, he is spending about 1 billion euro per year coming from all of you using Amazon. So he is using 1 billion euros per year for that. Elon Musk is a different type. He is, uh, according to the numbers I heard, about using about 300 million, not per year, but at once. And the other money comes from NASA and the DOD, the Defense uh, Ministry in, um, in the US. And then uh, Richard Branson, who is uh, using Virgin, uh, Virgin, uh, Virgin Atlantic and others to pay for his uh, Virgin uh, Galactic and uh, Virgin Orbit. So there are some new players in the game, and they play it in a different way by not asking for the micromanagement by an agency, but saying, we will offer something. And ESA is in this game. We have what is called a service offer request for the space debris. We are not going the same way as we did with other projects, and which are successful, by the way. But uh, now we are asking industry to come up with ideas, to come up with a price tag, and we, say, we tell them, we will accept your price tag only if you show us, justify us, that you have a business plan behind it for the future. We don't want to have a single shot. You come bring down one of our satellites. We want them to give us a business plan of service, do some service in space, etc. So this privatization is not a privatization. So far, it's a commercialization. Um, but privatization, this is uh, Jeff Bezos. That's privatization. And it will happen. Yes, it will happen. Well, I was actually, I was talking about privatization, but I'm also curious about the Aryan Group, which is 1980s, I believe, was the first commercial uh, flight group. Uh, Aryan Group? Yeah. Aryan Group. Could you also explain the Aryan Group really quickly? Okay, the Aryan Group the uh, story is the following. We, ha we are we're looking for the next launcher in Europe. Uh, we have the Ariane 5, very liable launcher, heavy launcher, very successful, originally built to transport also humans in space, but then changed because of financial restrictions. And then we said, OK, now it's time to look for a new launcher. And then there were debates, 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 debates. And suddenly industry, Airbus, came up and said, we have an idea. We, we built Ariane 6 with uh, a, a liquid core and uh, then either two or four solid boosters. These are the parts on the side. And uh, we offer you 
you European states, we offer you a price tag for that. A launch will be 70 million per launch of the smaller one and 90 million per launch for the bigger one. But, they said, the, and we will, offer, we will uh, invest ourselves 400 million euros on our own. But you, ESA, you, our member states, you give us more responsibility, you go back a little bit in the governance. And we said, okay, we are ready. So it was signed, they got, uh, they got uh, big support, we are talking overall about something like 4 billion euros to um, Ariane, uh, at that time uh, Airbus and uh, Avio, an Italian company, because we want to have a family, Vega C, Ariane 62, 64, doesn't matter right now, it's an interesting subject. And then we changed the governance, so we went back uh, partially, or not partially, really dramatically. And then they started to, with all this uh, prepar preparatory work, and for that they uh, found, founded a new company, which is called Ariane Group. Ariane Group comes from Ar Airbus Defense and Space, plus uh, Safran Launchers, a uh, French company. They, uh, they merged, so to say, no, they did not merge, they put together their forces in a new company called Ariane Group. And now Ariane Group has, according to all papers, the full responsibility to deliver. And this is an interesting story. Let's see what comes out of it. So, um, I would like to touch a bit more about that. The ASD Eurospace Advocacy Group fears that Europe has not only lost its comfortable lead in the commercial space flight industry, but is also falling behind the curve due to American government support and investment into its own commercial space flight industry. What are the, firstly, what are the key differences between the United States and Europe when it comes to the commercial space flight okay, industry? We have the so-called captive market. Captive market means that there are things in the market which you cannot get because it's linked to a national activity. So we will never launch the American spy satellites. It's a captive market. And the situation is that the captive market of Europe is rather small. Mm. But the captive market of the US is huge. The captive market of China is huge. The captive market of Russia is big. So, but the captive market of Europe is very small. So, the, the question is, and this is a political question, how do we behave with that? Do we say, and this was a position of my home country, unhindered access to space or autonomous access to space? You can have uh, good arguments for both of that. The European member states of ESA decided they want to have autonomous access to space as a strategic issue because of the following in the 60s last century it happened that Europe was building a satellite called Symphony. The satellite was launched by the Americans, and then the Americans said, okay, we launched it, but you're not allowed to use it for commercial purposes. And this was a little bit the, the starting point of saying, in some areas we need autonomy. For the navigation system, we have Galileo. For the launchers, we have Ariane 64, 62, and Vega and C in the, in the future. So autonomy as a political, strategical goal. This is the point. Now the question is, is it automatically that we have to be commercially competitive? That's a big question. If you want to have a political aut uh, autonomy, you do not have to ask at the same time with the same question or the same answer to be competitive. In the past we were with Ariane 5. We even were com competitive uh, compared to um, Proton, the, Amer the Russian uh, rocket which was much cheaper, but uh, Ariane was uh, very uh, stable, very reliable. Now the market has changed in the last years. The telecom market has changed because of you. You are using all uh, the internet on ground and using also the video by demand on ground. So the telecom market is, uh, telecom satellite market is really more or less dead. Factor of four to five less satellites than in the previous years. And Ariane 5 was living more, t more or less, not only by the, our science missions, but also by the satellites of um, telecommunication. In addition, we have these mega constellations and tiny satellites, which are lighter. So the question is, uh, what type of uh, rocket you need? And therefore, the, the, the situation is not comparable between the US, China, and Europe. 
but we still believe, and I personally also support that, that we need an autonomous access to space. We are right now developing the best we can do in this moment, 50% less expensive per launch, which is a big step, huh? 50%. But this is, not, this is not the point to stop. So we are right now looking already into the next generation. One big question is reusability. This is always mentioned immediately. Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk believe in that. But the question is really if we have some, a, a captive market of, let's say, something like four satellites plus some commercial activities. Let's assume we have eight or ten launches in Europe and you have a reusability of using the, the, the launcher 10 times. That would mean you have per year only one new rocket. You build only one new rocket, but you have a full factory being able to build 10. Uh, and you cannot stop after one month and send all people home. This is not the European understanding of social security. And that means by that, reusability is not the magic formula. It is a good idea. And we, we have all the concepts in Europe. Huh? I don't say, and we did it much earlier than the Americans. For instance, for Ariane 5, there was the idea, these boosters, these are the, the, the parts on the side, flyback boosters were developed already something like 10 years ago. They are not used because of this economic scale. So, yes, it's a fierce competition, and we are in the middle of it. Right. Speaking on competition, uh, Alain Charmeau, who runs the Ariane Space Group, was running was past running. 10 speeds. Okay. Sorry. It's over. Has said that SpaceX can kick Europe out of space if Ariane cannot learn how to launch rockets even cheaper. If SpaceX can do this, what does Ariane need to do in order to keep up with this competition so we you know, aren't kicked out of space? Okay. So the, the setup of SpaceX and uh, Ariane is really dif different. So number one is, I, I explained already, the question of reusability. Number two is our social system uh, is, and I'm in, in favor of it, is not fire and hire, or hire and fire, depending on what you would do, like to do first. And this is a different world. Number three, the technology Elon Musk is using is a technology which was developed by NASA and he got it free of charge. Very nice. And therefore, I admire him to use it. He, he is, and the, 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 the model how he is selling uh, rockets is also nice. If you call him today and say, Elon, I would like to get a Falcon 9, uh, he would offer you most probably between 50 and 60 million uh, dollars a flight. If you say, this is NASA headquarters, I would like to buy a Falcon 9, he would ask you for the double, for twice the price. Um, and this is something we are not doing in Europe. Uh, we are not doing this type of gambling or, or however you call it. Uh, this is a disadvantage for us. What we are trying as uh, ESA, we are trying to convince our member states um, to really, and also the European Commission, to launch European, to fly European. This is w what we believe we should do. Still taking into account competition for the best price. But um, if you i give you an example. If I come back to the example of, uh, let's say, 50 or 60 million euro for a Falcon. Um, if now a European company, a European country, is buying a Falcon 9 rocket for, let's say, 60 million euro or dollars, doesn't matter. Then you, you, you go to the bank and you make a transfer of 60 million dollars or euros to America. The money is lost. If a European state Let's say the Netherlands is launching with a European launcher. They pay also maybe 70 million, but more than 30% is direct tax. So it flows back. And still you have workforce which is paid through your money, and each and every one of the, the worker is paying tax in Europe and is also buying goods in Europe, which are again by tax uh, getting money back into, uh, into the European uh, situation. So therefore, one has to, change, to compare the overall numbers and not just the price tag. All right. I think this is a good opportunity to once again open up for an audience question. Yes, instantly, one there. Oh, sorry. So you've mentioned Elon Musk a little hesitantly, and my question is about him, I'm sorry. 
Um, I wonder, he paints a pretty bold picture of the future in space. You know, humans and Mars, I think he said 2026. Seems a little ridiculous, but it's also, you know, it's, he also sets the bar high. I wonder if you think that his vision is a positive influence, that it inspires people, or that it could be damaging in some way, and if so, how? Thank you. I have to accept that he is inspiring people. He is inspiring people by sending a Tesla Roadster into space. He is inspiring people by saying we will be in 2019 on the moon, which is this year. He is inspiring people by saying we will fly to, to Mars, uh, we will colonize Mars, we will make a nuke on a nuclear bomb on the surface of Mars to have a better atmosphere. He is inspiring people, but inspiration is normally is a very positive thing, but I think we all are uh, smart enough to think a little bit in deeper into this. So Tesla, to send a, a car into space, what is it? Is it useful? Is, it, is, it, is there any specific, I mean, he could send the same Tesla car, but with some telecommunication capabilities. Then I would say, yes, he made a, a satellite which looks like a Tesla Roadster, but is a telecommunication satellite. It would be a different story for me. To send just debris, space debris in orbit, I'm not very in favor of that. So, number two, to, to go to Mars and to stay on Mars, I, saw, I told already what I believe about that. He's also talking about one-way trips. Huh? He believes that people would also uh, pay for one-way for, for one, uh, one trip. And I'm, I'm, I think this is not a good idea. And he does not have the technology for that. If you look back, you cannot look back, but I can, to the 60s of last century when they were flying to the moon. At that time, they, all of these astronauts, they were really, really, really lucky because there was no solar flare. Otherwise, they would have come back barbecued. Um, they had a barbecue mode. That means the Apollo capsule was turning like this. But if there would be a solar flare, they would be really barbecued. Uh, and they were lucky that in none of these uh, as, uh, Apollo flights, there was a heavy solar uh, storm. Now, if you go to Mars, the probability that you are hit in between by a solar flare becomes much more, uh, much higher, and the, the cosmic radiation is very, very strong. So all our spacecrafts of today are not feasible to do such a trip. And look to another point. If you should, next time when an astronaut or cosmonaut is landing on the Earth, you should look it into the TV what happens. They are landing in the Kazakh steppe, and what happens then? Are they jumping out and saying, ah, yes, now I'm here, I'm building something? No, there are a lot of doctors taking care of them and s very slowly bringing them back in life, right? I'm, I'm surprised if whether Elon is waiting already on Mars to help the people out of the capsule. It is half a year trip to go there. You cannot do it with today to technology in less than half a year. So somebody should be there waiting and help the people. That's not possible. And the next step is, if after one month of travel, the astronaut gets really sick, I'm talking about really an illness, not about a small surgery here or there, I'm talking about really, let's assume this bad word, cancer or whatever. What do you do? For the next two years, no treatment? Is that something we really dare to do? So I'm afraid, I'm not, I would not send astronauts to uh, to Mars uh, at this time. So we need other spacecrafts. We need spacecrafts which are better radiation shielded. We need spacecrafts which can maybe turn and go back. If you saw the Mar Martian, uh, it took him also a while to come back. Huh? Uh, but, and there's this argument, but we tested it in Antarctica. People can stay in Antarctica for half a year. But if there is really a bad situation, they can send um, uh, doctors, they can send whatever, medicamentation and uh, all of this. So therefore, I think humans will go to Mars. I'm convinced, but not so fast. And w when one gives a vision, so my understanding is also the difference between vision and utopia is a vision can be reached, an utopia is far out. And to go to, to Mars is really, really something in the future. I'm happy uh, if I'm still alive when somebody goes to, the, to Mars.
Unfortunately, we are running out of time, so that's we won't be able to ask it's any my more I'm questions. Answering too long. I'm a professor, therefore always long answers always long to short answers. questions. But I guess this uh, question does lead us to wonder, when will we actually get to Mars? Will we still see the landing on Mars on our smartphones? Yes. It on will, our will be on a Tuesday because Monday we go already to the moon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but who do you really think will get to Mars first, though? No, we will okay. first go to the moon, for sure, because we have to learn how to all the technology we need to use the, in the, the resources in, in situ. We have to learn how to use the water on the south pole of the uh, yep. moon. We expect water and all of this. We have to learn a lot on the moon and then we can go to Mars. And I would be really happy if I'm still alive. But um, I have to say I'm 64 now. Maybe no. I think this is a funny opening for our last question, which was, would you ever go to space given the opportunity? So if it was in your lifetime, okay. if you had the opportunity. If, if right now somebody would call me, I would do it. Today. I really? have an appointment in, in uh, Den Haag later on in The Hague, but I would skip that, uh, cancel that and go. Beautiful. Beautiful. I think, sadly, we do have to cut off the interview because we are out of time. Next week, uh, we have an interview with Peter Huxley, the U.S. ambassador, so everyone hopefully come to that. Uh, now I'd like to ask for a warm round of applause for our guest, Director of the European Space Agency. Thank you.